So a very good morning and welcome back to your friends, colleagues and uh, my dear students. Welcome to the Faker Point Gateway of Learning. In the last episode we saw how to go about examining the pupil, the actual technique of examination of the pupil. Today I am going to take you through how to interpret the signs that define while examining the pupil. And I like to make it very simple for you. Point number one, do a screening test and if you find that the direct reflex of the pupil is brisk in both eyes. Remember what I told you that a brisk pupil means that the pupil should have good amplitude and good speed of contraction. So if you have brisk pupillary reaction in both eyes, that means you don't have to continue with any further examination. You need not do the consensual light reflex and you need not do the near reflex. Now why? Because the direct reflex is always equal in strength to the consensual. And if both pupils are reacting equally and briskly, then it is superfluous to check for the consensual light reflex. And again, the near reflex need not be checked because in cases of light near dissociation, it's the direct light reflex that gets affected. The near reflex is almost always preserved. Therefore, if you have a good direct light reflex, then you don't have to go ahead and uh, check for consensual and near reflex. But the problem will come if one of the pupils is reacting sluggishly. I told you, you have to always introduce yourself to the patient. You have to descri describe what you want to do and get an informed consent from the patient. Okay, so I'm going to examine you and I'll throw bright light. If you have any discomfort, you let me know. So let us start the exam. Let us assume that I'm throwing light on the left pupil and I note the reaction. The reaction is sluggish. A sluggish reaction means that either there is a problem with the afferent limb of the pupillary reflex or there could be a problem with the efferent limb of the pupillary reflex. In order to find out uh, or differentiate between the afferent and the efferent limb, what I have to do is to check the consensual on the other end. And like I told you, to check the consensual light reflex, you have to first bounce the light of the patient's chin, so both the pupils are illuminated, and then you throw light into the left eye and look for the right eye constriction. So when I look at the right eye constriction, I find that the right pupil is also reacting sluggish. So now let us pause and think how we can analyze this result. So when light is shown on the left eye, the afferent limb is the optic nerve of the left eye. The efferent limb is the third nerve or the oculomotor nerve of the left eye and the opposite third nerve or the oculomotor nerve carries the consensual light reflex. So light when it falls on the left pupil will cause the constriction of both the left and the right pupil. If there is a lesion in the optic nerve or the afferent limb Therefore, both the third nerves will not get the afferent impulses and therefore both pupils will not react. So, the left pupil, the direct light reflex is sluggish, its consensual on the other right is also sluggish. Now, let us move on and examine the right eye pupil. For that, you have to come to the right side of the patient, ask the patient to fixate at a distant target and then you check the pupillary reflex, you find that the right pupil is reacting briskly to light. Now let me check the consensual. The consensual light reflex is also brisk. So what this means is the right afferent limb or the right optic nerve is functioning normally as well as both the left and the right third nerves are also functioning normally which is the reason why the direct and the consensual light reflex are brisk. This therefore pins a lesion down to the left optic nerve. Brisk. Now, when you have a picture like this, where the right direct light reflex is brisk and the consensual is also brisk on the other side, whereas on the left side you have the, the direct and the consensual is sluggish, then it indicates that the, this patient has a left optic nerve pathology or a left afferent pupillary defect. So when the afferent limb pathology indicates diseases of the retina, diseases of the optic nerve up to the chiasma. 
So beyond the chiasma, you know that the nasal fibers of the pupillary pathway will decussate and in the optic tract actually contains fibers from the temporal side of the same eye and the nasal fibers from the opposite eye and therefore you cannot, the pupillary reflexes cannot be relied upon completely in lesions beyond the optic nerve. So whenever we talk about reliable pupillary reflex, we are talking about afferent even though the afferent limb starts at the optic nerve and ends right at the level of the pretectal nucleus of the midbrain. Now behind, behind the chiasma, since uh, each optic tract contains contribution from both the eyes, it is difficult to interpret pupillary reaction. However, there is a test known as Wernicke's pupillary reflex where depending on whether you throw the light on the nasal half of the retina or the temporal half of the retina, you will elicit different types of pupillary reaction. This is called Wernicke's hemianopic pupil. But I am not going into that, I am going to keep it simple. Now, the efferent limb will include the entire oculomotor nerve as well as problems in the iris. Like example, a tonic pupil that does not uh, constrict well, a traumatic midriasis, patients using pilocarpine, small pupils because of uh, posterior sciatica and uh, because of acute anterior uveitis. Now, all these conditions are lesions that, that affect the efferent limb of the pupillary reflex. In an afferent pupillary defect, the direct and its consensual on the opposite eye will both be affected. Now in efferent pupillary defect, the one side of the eye is affected. For instance, if she has an efferent pupillary defect of the left eye, then irrespective of which eye you throw the light, the left pupil will not constrict. So an efferent defect always indicates a same side defect, whether you throw light on the left eye or right eye. If you have a tonic pupil on the left side, then this left pupil will not constrict irrespective of whether you throw light on the left eye or the right eye. Afferent pupillary defect will be manifest bilaterally because the afferent limb goes to the midbrain, to the pretectal nucleus and from there the impulses spread via both oculomotor nerve to produce constriction of both pupils. Now, whenever you talk about pupillary reaction, you have to know that there are three types. It can be either completely absent or it could be sluggish or it could be brisk. So, a brisk pupillary light reflex means that the pupil will constrict with good amplitude and good speed of constriction. The sluggish is when there is a low amplitude as well as a low speed of constriction. Now sometimes when the pupil is reacting sluggishly and you are not very sure whether there is a sluggish or a brisk reaction, then you can confirm this by doing something known as a swinging flashlight test which was first described by Marcus Kahn. Now, efferent pupillary defects can either be absolute, where there is total absence of the direct and consensual reflex, as in an amorotic pupil, or it could be relative, where there is a sluggish direct and consensual light reflex. This occurs in partial optic atrophy and certain retinal pathologies like retinal detachments and ischemic CRVOs. Since sluggish pupillary reaction can sometimes be difficult to make out, we can use the swinging flashlight test to confirm the presence of RAPD. Now this test revolves around the concept that the direct and the consensual light reflexes are equal in magnitude. A normal afferent pathway will generate a stronger response than one that suffers from an afferent pupillary defect. In the adjacent photo, the left pupil has an afferent pupillary defect. Now let's take the swinging flashlight test in three steps. Step one, when light is shown on the normal pupil, this produces a brisk constriction of both pupils. Step two, light is shown on the affected left eye. The pupil instead of constricting will dilate due to the more powerful consensual response of the right eye. This is called breakthrough dilatation. Step 3. When light is again shown on the right eye, the pupil will constrict. This constriction of one pupil and the breakthrough dilation of the other is called the Marcus Gunn pupil or Marcus Gunn sign and that's the best way of confirming the RAPD. There are three ways of quantifying or measuring the afferent pupillary defect. One is called the edge pupil cycle time. Then you have the neutral density filters which are placed in front of the normal eye till the 
reflexes become equal and finally there is a Kestenbaum ratio which is a ratio of resting pupil size of the normal and abnormal pupils. Now let's see how we can perform the test. The light falls, the, the illuminated beam of light falls only in one pupil. Then you, you uh, shine the light on this pupil, then you slowly move it, shine the light on this pupil, again you slowly move. So the light should fall only on the pupil and should not fall on the other side. Now the speed at which you move the torch between the two pupils is that you mentally tell yourself 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. That is the speed at which you have to move. If you move it too fast or too slow, then you will not be able to appreciate the Marcus gun swinging flashlight test. So this pupil is constricting. We come back, this is constricting. I go there, this pupil is dilating. This is what happens. So there is a breakthrough dilation that occurs when you put the light in the eye with the afferent pupillary defect. So with this we will conclude the part 2 of interpretation of the pupillary reflex signs. So next I will tell you about the detection and the interpretation of anisocoria.